Hey guys, uh, let's review for test two. We are going to go over some of the main concepts for chapters five and six. Um, you should have your vocabulary, you should have your historical figures review, you should have all of your um, review questions from each section, um, just like the bell works we were doing. Um, you should have lots of resources. There are a ton of videos linked in Schoology. You have lots of things um, to help you study. Uh, there's also a Kahoot challenge. Uh, the link is also on Schoology. Um, so here we go. Here is your chapter five and six review. All right, chapter five was all about absolutism. So what does absolute rule mean? It is a government with a leader, in this case monarchs have complete control. They are not limited by laws. Uh, according to the uh, concept that uh, was established in Europe, the divine right of kings, um, Christian kings were chosen by God, and so therefore if you questioned the king, you were questioning God, and so no one was willing to take that chance. Uh, kings believed that their power was given by God and could not be taken away or challenged. Um, later on, we're going to see that the Enlightenment rulers in Chapter 6, or the Enlightened, um, the leaders of the Enlightenment, uh, believed that the king's power came from the people, uh, not from God. All right, who was the ruler of Spain when the Spanish territory in the Netherlands split from Spain? That would be Philip II. He had become the leader of Spain after his father, Charles V, who had inherited five thrones, uh, abdicated, uh, which means he left his position as king, uh, and gave Philip half of the empire. He gave the other half to his brother, and we will see him a little bit later. All right, what type of government did the new nation have? Uh, the Netherlands became the first European Republic, uh, which does not, uh, it does not mean that there is direct voting, but it means that there are representatives of the people in the government. What two groups were fighting religious wars throughout Europe in the 1700s? That would be the Catholic and Protestant um, groups within Christianity. Um, after the Protestant Reformation began, there was a lot of wars, um, in which uh, they were trying to gain control of nations and of people um, in order to gain power and prestige. All right, who helped Louis the Thirteenth rule? Uh, you will see him pictured over in the corner. Um, Louis the Thirteenth was king of France, um, and he uh, was not a great king. He was a weak king uh, and a uh, fr a French Catholic cardinal uh, helped him run the government. His name is Cardinal Richelieu. A cardinal is a, a church official, a high-ranking uh, Catholic church official. Uh, so the next part says, what did this person do to limit the power of the nobles? Uh, he cut the nobles' power. Um, he told them they could not build walls around their cities. Uh, they had to destroy their castles. Um, and uh, he basically said that they shouldn't have to hide from their king. Um, and he also hired people from the middle class, not nobles, to work in the government for him, uh, making government jobs more accessible to... Um, people outside of the nobility. Why was Louis XIV so unhappy with the nobles when he took power? Um, so if you go back through uh, the notes on this section, you will find that Louis became, uh, this is Louis XIV, the son of uh, Louis the um, 13th that we just saw on the other slide, uh, Louis the 14th became king when he was only four. Um, and during his uh, young years, uh, he had a regent, which means someone who rules for him. His name was Cardinal Mazarian. Cardinal Mazarian made a few mistakes or a few um, dis, uh, disagreeable uh, moves within France, um, and the nobles rebelled against him. And when they rebelled, they often threatened to kill Louis. Um, basically, their explanation was that if they took out the Bourbon line, uh, the family line, um, that they could uh, solve a lot of France's problems. Um, and so they were kind of, uh, they put Louis under threat. Uh, and when he became old enough to run the country and took over, um, he could have come out as weak and scared after being threatened so many times, but he becomes the opposite. He becomes extremely strong uh, and very strong-willed, and he bends 
the nobles to that will. Um, and he is going to uh, force them to follow a lot of strict rules. Um, <clears throat> and he is going to uh, become the most absolute monarch that France has ever seen. All right, so how was he an example of absolutism? He gave more power to government officials and made sure that they answered only to him. He also worked hard to increase the wealth of France. He urged people to settle in New France, the colony in Canada, uh, where he made a lot of money from the fur trade. Uh, Louis enjoyed a life of luxury. He built a very large palace. He also made sure that nobles had to depend on his favor. Uh, and then if they offended him, he would make sure that all of the other nobles basically shunned them. Um, France had more people and a larger army than any other country in Europe at the time. Um, he was, uh, very much, um, the center of life in France <clears throat> and, uh, everything about him. He was the sun king. Um, his palace at Versailles, uh, has little suns all over it and he was very much a symbol of the power of the king. All right, in 1618, another religious war broke out in what is now Germany. What is this war called? It was called the Thirty Years' War because it lasted about 30 years. How did Ferdinand II pay his army? Uh, Ferdinand was the brother of Charles V, uh, and so when Charles V split the empire, he gave the first half to, for, uh, to uh, Philip. We talked about him a few minutes ago, and then he gave the second half to his brother Ferdinand. Um, and he became Holy Roman Empire, and when he did not have enough money to pay his troops, he allowed his troops to loot and rob the towns that they were passing through in order to make the money that they wanted. Um, this is obviously not a very ethical decision, uh, and it made a lot of people dislike Ferdinand and distrust him. All right, what are some similarities between the War of Austrian Succession and the Seven Years' War? Um, if you uh, read through your notes, or if you go back and read through them now, you will find that the War of Austrian Succession and the Seven Years' War are extremely um, complicated, complex wars that are um, that mirror each other very much. So both lasted for seven years. Both were at the core, started between Austria and Prussia. When Prussia tried to take a small piece of territory from Austria because the king, Frederick of Prussia, uh, believed that the queen of Austria, Maria Theresa, would not fight back because she was a woman. But she did. She defended her country and she did it twice. When the first war was over, they gave, uh, they um, returned all territory that was taken except for the original piece he had invaded. They let him keep it. So in the second war, he, she was going back for the territory that she had tried to earn back the first time. Um, unfortunately for Maria Theresa, she is going to lose both of those wars. Um, Britain and France are both going, are going to be involved in both wars, but they are going to switch their alliances. Britain originally allies with Austria and then in the second war allies with Prussia. Um, both were fought on three continents, Europe over the territory of Cilicia and Asia over territory in India and in North America over colonial possessions. We call the North American portion the... French and Indian War. Uh, not because the French and Indians were fighting each other, but because the French and Indians were fought were fighting together against the British. All right, what group ruled over Russia before Ivan III took control and created a new Russia? That would be the Mongols. What nickname was Ivan IV given and why? Um, well, I went back and told you that Ivan III was known as Ivan the Great because he is the one who ended Mongol rule and created the new Russia. His grandson, however, Ivan IV, was called Ivan the Terrible because after the death of his wife, he became a suspicious and intimidating leader. He added lands to Russia but created a secret police force to spy on his enemies and even killed his own son. Okay, so Russia gets a rough reputation for a reason. Now, after his leading, uh, he did kill his son, so he did not have an heir. Uh, and since he did not have a prince to become king, there was some confusion over who should leave the country, uh, lead the country. Um, and things got very violent during that period, and so it is called the Time of Troubles. Uh, and after the Time of Troubles, the next question is, what new family came to rule Russia after the Time of Troubles? And that was the Romanov family. Uh, a guy named Mikhail Romanov was chosen to be the uh, czar. Um, and the czars uh, of Russia will be Romanov family members all the way from here until 1917 after World War I. So we'll see what happens there. 
All right, later, another Romanov, uh, Peter the Great uh, Romanov of Russia, um, tried to modernize and westernize Russia. Modernize obviously means to catch up, you know, technologically and um, and things like that. Um, westernize means to make it more like Europe. Um, China and Japan and all of that would be considered Eastern culture. Uh, and Europe, uh, Western Europe would be Spain and France, uh, Italy, etc. So he wanted to make his country more like Western Europe. So if you go back, you'll see a couple pictures of some of the things he did, like building St. Petersburg, his capital, or forcing uh, his nobility to cut off their Mongol-style beards because the Europeans were clean-shaven at that time, um, and he wanted them to act more European. So here's a list of some things. He put the Russian Orthodox Church, uh, which is Eastern Orthodox Christianity, under his control and cut the power of the nobility. He built up the army and made it better trained. He brought potatoes as a new food, which had come from the New World to Europe. He began Russia's first newspaper. He gave more social status to women. He even told the nobles to adopt Western clothes. He also promoted education by building a school for navigation and one for the arts and sciences. Uh, Peter also built a new capital called St. Petersburg, um, which is sort of named after him. Um, it's also closer than Moscow to Europe. All right, uh, now jumping into England. Why is the Petition of Right important in England? Um, the Petition of Right was a document that was um, that Charles I was forced to sign. Uh, it says that the king will not imprison subjects without cause. Uh, they can't just lock them up because they insulted them. Uh, they would not levy taxes without Parliament's consent. That means they can't raise taxes. They would not house soldiers in private homes. A lot of times people are shocked by this one, but historically, uh, when armies were moved, if they came through your town and they needed somewhere to stay, they would say, okay, you have a large farm. You're going to take 20 soldiers for the night. We're going to need you to feed them, find them somewhere to sleep, etc. Um, and they would just do this when they came through towns. Um, this is obviously not something you would want to happen. Uh, 20 soldiers staying at your house could cause a lot of destruction. Uh, they could eat a lot, you know, a month's worth of food, etc. This is a problem. Okay. Uh, the king would also not impose martial law, which means military law in peacetime. Uh, this document is extremely important, not just for those things, but here at the bottom, the last line, it set forth the idea that the law, the law was higher than than the king and this is a big deal uh, in a society when the the kings believe that they are chosen by God all right describe the English Civil War all right well the English Civil War is between the supporters of Parliament and the supporters of the king um, Charles the first uh, the same one who had signed the petition of right he immediately ignored it uh, and when Parliament tried to limit his powers he tried to have them arrested and then the loyal guards uh, the guards that were loyal to the king and the guards who were loyal to Parliament began fighting and this started a civil war uh, so it was four years long in the end Parliament wins but as you know in 2020 um, there is still a Queen of England so we know that that's going to be um, a short-lived uh, republic. So the Puritan leader of the Parliament, Oliver Cromwell, is going to make uh, is going to make a very strict new government. He's Puritan, so he doesn't believe that you should be allowed to dance, sing, play competitive sports, or go to the theater. Um, all of those things he believed were sinful; uh, that they glorified human achievement and not God. Uh, and so he made all of those things outlawed. Um, and so after he died, nobody else really wanted to keep that strict of a government. Uh, and so the parliament actually asked Charles II, the son of Charles I, who had been executed, by the way. Um, Charles I was put on trial and executed. Um, and this was a big deal because it was the first public execution of a king. 
Uh, but they asked his son, Charles II, if he would like the job back. Like, would you like to be king? You were supposed to be king. We kind of removed your dad. Would you like the job? And he says yes. So he comes back. He kind of calms everything down. Um, so that is the English Civil War. All right, then it links us to the Glorious Revolution. So Charles II rules for a while. He's okay. But then after he passes away, his son James becomes king, King James II. Well, King James is Catholic. This is a problem because the English church, the Anglican church, uh, the head of that church is the king. And you can't be a Catholic king in a Protestant church. That's not how it works. Uh, and so this had happened a couple of times before uh, with James the I um, and with others. Um, and so this is a problem. So they... Um, Parliament and James kept fighting, and so Parliament snuck behind James's back and contacted his daughter Mary, who is living in the Netherlands with her husband William, uh, the Duke of Orange. And they were Protestant, so the Parliament asked them if they would like to come and be King and Queen of England. Um, they said sure, so they brought an army. But um, James left. He fled and went to France to hide out. Um, and so William and Mary were able to take over in a bloodless revolution, which is why it's called the Glorious Revolution. Um, in return for this, Parliament asked them to sign the Constitution and Bill of Rights of England, uh, which creates a constitutional monarchy in England. And the basics of this system are still in place in England, although the king from this period on is going to continually lose power to the parliament in which today Queen Elizabeth has a parliament vote, but she is not uh, overly powerful. All right, moving on to chapter six, uh, Revolution and Enlightenment. It was a scientific revolution, uh, the Enlightenment and the American Revolution. Uh, what did Nicholas Copernicus discover? He is going to discover what is called the heliocentric model, which is the sun-centered universe. Um, he's going to study that. He also was um, afraid to publish it at first because he was afraid the Catholic Church would attack him, which they probably would have. Um, and so he waited until he was very sick and old and was dying anyway to have it published. Uh, what were Galileo's accomplishments and what happened to him because of this? He made one of the first telescopes and used it to study the planets. He found that Jupiter had moons and the sun had dark spots and Earth's moon was rough. Um, these statements went against the church teachings and the Pope brought him in front of the Inquisition, which is a church court. And Galileo, under threat of bodily harm, was forced to deny the truth and say that he had lied and live under house arrest for the rest of his life. All right, who developed the scientific method? The English writer Francis Bacon is usually given all of the credit, um, but Rene Descartes would also be huge on that list for helping develop it. Um, the scientific method is, of course, the idea of coming up with a hypothesis, testing it, collecting data, uh, and then coming to a conclusion uh, that you have probably learned in science class. All right, and uh, so they are both... They are both... Mm -mm, mm -mm. Okay, so uh, both of these guys are going to use a different kind of reasoning. Uh, one is going to use inductive, the other is going to use deductive. Um, I put a great uh, couple of videos on this on Schoology. Uh, these are types of reasoning. Uh, inductive is where you think of a, a some specific facts and you move on to make a general statement about those. And deductive reasoning is the opposite. You look at a general statement and you're able to pick out specific truths. All right, next. Who studied the universal law of gravitation and wrote Principia? Uh, this would be Isaac Newton. He's going to be, this is the famous story about the apple falling on his head. He also is going to um, talk about the laws of motion, like a object in motion will stay in motion unless acted on by an outside force. He's going to calculate the specific um, formula for gravity. All right, what new scientific instruments were invented? Uh, Janssen is going to invent a microscope. Uh, Fahrenheit and Celsius both, both make temperature scales. Edward Jenner is going to invent vaccina vaccinations. Uh, Galileo had improved the telescope. Uh, the barometer is invented. Uh, lots of interesting things. William Harvey discovered what about the human body. William Harvey learned how the heart pumped the blood and how it went all the way through your body. The blood in your arm doesn't stay in your arm. It goes around your entire body. 
uh, major contributions of philosophs. All right, so on the next couple of slides, we're going to see uh, some important philosophs. Uh, number one is Montesquieu. Uh, he is going to study governments. He wrote about three types of governments, and then he described in England's government with the three branches and separation of powers. The reason this is important is because it has impact on the U.S. Constitution. Voltaire uh, was one of the most important Enlightenment thinkers, maybe the most important. Uh, he is going to be a deist, uh, which is a religion based on the Newtonian machine world theory. He is going to write pamphlets, novels, plays, letters, essays, lots of things. And his uh, most favorite uh, issue or his most important issue to him was promoting religious toleration. All right, Beccaria wrote about justice systems. He said that punishment should fit the crime. You should not be punished too harsh for something. Uh, if you steal a loaf of bread because you need to feed your family, you should not get the same punishment as a murderer. He also said um, he did not support the death penalty at all. He thought that it was barbaric. All right, Diderot uh, published uh, and edited the encyclopedia, although um, Marie-Therese Joffin helped pay for it. Um, it's a 28-volume collection, uh, and their idea was trying to collect all of human knowledge. Uh, Adam Smith, who we didn't really talk about, wrote a book called The Wealth of Nations in which he talked about economics. We'll talk a little bit more about more about him later. Uh, Jean-Jacques Rousseau wrote a book called The Social Contract, and he believed that he, um, people agreed to be governed. As long as we were not rebelling, we were actively agreeing to be governed. All right, um, list three women that the chapter mentions uh, concerning the Enlightenment. Um, so, uh, we have, um, Mary Estelle, who wrote the, uh, wrote about the lack of women's education and about inequalities in marriage, where he's Mary Wollstonecraft, who wrote more about women's education and also urged women to enter in male-dominated fields like medicine, becoming doctors, and politics. Um, uh, Marie-Therese Joffin, uh, she became famous for hosting salon parties in Paris, and she also supplied money for the Encyclopedia Project. What were the natural rights that philosophs promoted? Uh, John Locke said life, liberty, and property. Of course, we know that the United States changed that to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Uh, freedom of religion, which was a big uh, calling card of Voltaire, and then freedom of speech. There's lots of other ones, but those are kind of some of the main ones. What invention helped in education and spreading of enlightenment ideas through books, pamphlets, and newspapers? Movable type printing press. Here is Gutenberg back to help us out. What was the importance of salons? So writers and artists would meet um, really smart uh, home like people uh, and educated, well-educated people and wealthy people would all hang out together in these salon parties, these gatherings where they would just talk about stuff. Um, and they would talk about the latest writing, the latest art, the latest publications, the latest ideas, uh, and that's how many Enlightenment ideas spread. Uh, women who hosted this party had the opportunity to sway political opinion and influence by uh, bringing in the right books and inviting the right people and uh, buying the right art. So uh, they were able to work in behind the scenes. All right, what was the significance of the encyclopedia? It was an attempt to collect all human knowledge. Uh, Diderot and some other uh, philosophs worked together to write it. It attacked a lot of religious superstition and promoted tolerance. It was sold to doctors, clergymen, teachers, lawyers, and everything, uh, so it did a lot to help spread the Enlightenment ideals. Why does the middle class support the idea so much? Uh, many Enlightenment ideas promoted the idea of removing birthright privileges of royalty and nobility, and the middle class would have benefited greatly from that. Uh, they liked the ideas of equality, but they did not mean it the way that we mean it when we say equality because they really only meant that they wanted wealthy people, uh, commoners, wealthy commoners, to be equal to the nobility, not to make all citizens equal to each other. All right, how did art, music, and literature change? Art moved in new directions. Um, we went from Baroque style to neoclassical style. Uh, and in architecture, that means we went from extremely gaudy uh, to more clean cut. Okay, so Baroque versus neoclassical. All right, music went from deep, loud, choral uh, organ music uh, to more light, elegant music of like Mozart and Beethoven. You can, uh, you know, YouTube some of their music and see what that sounds like. All right, in this period, the novel became popular as well, so that's some new literature. Uh, fun stories, you know, sometimes really long with lots of um, twists and turns uh, to uh, read about. I'm sure you guys have read a novel or two in school. 
All right. Um, your book then, uh, are your notes, our discussions talked about enlightenment, enlightened despots. So these are kings or queens who try to rule by enlightenment principles, uh, but still maintain power. Uh, they tried to influence uh, the uh, enlightened leaders, tried to influence the rulers to rule fairly, and sometimes rulers tried. So we're going to look at three, Frederick the Great, Joseph the Second, and Catherine the Great. Uh, Frederick the Great was from Prussia. He was the one who invaded Austria earlier in our talk, uh, but he gave his people religious freedom and improved schooling and limit, but he, uh, allowed some freedom of speech. Uh, he also, uh, abolished the use of torture in his courts, but then he also did nothing to help the serfs, uh, and basically, um, made the life for the serfs and the poor worse. Uh, Joseph II of Austria, the son of Maria Theresa, um, did in serfdom abolish the death penalty, established equality before the law, uh, and religious toleration, uh, and he really, really tried to make a difference in Austria, but as soon as he died, the nobles put all those things back in place. So, unfortunately, his uh, reforms won't last. Then we have Catherine the Great of Russia, who took the throne after several weak kings, um, and she really tried to reform Russia, but because she was a woman, she was afraid to lose her position. She was also foreign, um, and uh, she had been married to the Russian king, um, and she was too afraid to make too many major changes. So she actually did try to free the serfs. It was a disaster, and it caused a rebellion. So, um, yeah, so there's a bloody peasant rebellion there that uh, that ruins that for her. All right, she did uh, manage to gain some land for Russia, so she gets some good press uh, in Russia. All right, uh, some of the issues that pushed the 13 American colonies away from England. Uh, we had mostly had our own self-government for a very long time. There's a big ocean between us and England, and uh, they had a hard time keeping up with us. Uh, then when they tried to pull us back in and gain more control over us, we did not like it. Uh, so it says one of the laws forced the colonies to only trade with Britain. Uh, that made businesses uh, less efficient and they wanted to trade with other countries where they could buy the goods cheaper. Uh, many people disagree with this. Lots of people smuggled uh, things in illegally. Uh, after the French and Indian War, or the Seven Years' War, uh, Britain attempted to impose taxes to help offset the war expenses. Basically, they wanted us to help pay for our own protection. Some people would say that's a reasonable request. We said, in return, we'd like a parliament seat. Some say well, that is also a reasonable request, but neither one of us are willing to budge, and so we ended up in the American Revolution. Uh, one of the major taxes, or one of the major events in this, is the Stamp Act, where um, England put a tax on all paper for goods and we had to pay the tax. Um, if you did not have it, you would get in trouble. So the American colonists responded with a boycott of all British goods. All right, what happened in 1776 that disrupted England's colonial dominance? That is a fancy sentence that means we broke up with them. Uh, in July of 1776, we announced that we were um, going to become independent. Uh, we sent out the Declaration of Independence on, it, it was signed on July 4th, uh, and it was sent out to let the world know that we were now going to be independent. All right, before our modern constitution, there was another, what was it called? Uh, originally, our government was set up under something called the Articles of Confederation. It was a very weak um, document that tied the states together very, very loosely and let all of the states kind of do their own thing. They had their own money, they had their own trade agreements, they had their own army, um, and then they had their own taxes, um, everything was separate, uh, that is not efficient, and so eventually we are going to scrap that one and write the current constitution. What Enlightenment ideas were used in the current U.S. Constitution? Separation of powers, checks and balances, freedom of religion, speech, press, and assembly, fair justice, power comes from the people, uh, and lots more. Like, most of our Constitution is based on Enlightenment ideas. Uh, the philosophes of Europe actually uh, met Thomas Jefferson. He spent some time in France, and he talked a lot about these freedoms and these things that we wanted. Um, and so, he, they, um, and Ben Franklin as well, uh, these guys had traveled to Europe, they had met the Enlightenment thinkers, uh, and they brought a lot of their ideas back to us. All right, what makes a federal system? Our new constitution is going to create a federal system in which power is shared between the national and state governments. Uh, the national or federal government has the power to levy taxes, raise an army, regulate trade, and make a national currency, so we all have the same money. Um, and then uh, the powers of the 
that the Articles of Confederation had not allowed. So all of those things are going to create our federal system. Uh, our original system gave the states more powers than the federal government, uh, but after the Civil War, we're going to see an increasing tilt towards the federal government where the federal government has more power than the states. All right, what are the first 10 amendments of the Constitution called? This is the Bill of Rights. This is all the stuff that kind of makes America unique. Um, so freedom of speech, religion, press, assembly, the right to bear arms, the protection against unreasonable search and seizure. Don't forget that unreasonable part. Uh, they guarantee trial by jury, due process of law, protection of property rights. Uh, it's wonderful. Uh, it gives us a lot of the rights that we think we're just born with and that everyone should have. Um, and so we're, we're pretty proud of those. Now, there's lots more amendments since then. I think the total is up to like 29. Um, the 19th Amendment, the um, right for women to vote, is actually having its 100th anniversary this year because it was passed in 1920 and it is now 2020. Uh, so congratulations uh, to all the girls out there who can now vote. Um, and uh, I will be celebrating by voting this year. Um, so I hope that um, this helped you review. I hope you are ready for your test. Um, good luck tomorrow. Go play the Kahoot or this. I, I'm sorry. Good luck today. Probably you're taking this. Uh, you're probably watching this on Friday morning. Um, I'm, sh I'm sorry that it's late. I'm sorry it's recorded late and good luck on your test.